Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 140. Oh, yeah. Dang. I know. That is a lot of talking. <laughs> it is. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of hours of just our voices out there. Yeah, we really appreciate all of you who have been tuning in all of those episodes. I mean, I'm sure there's some of you out there who have listened to all of that. And thank you. We really, really appreciate y'all. So yeah, we just had a couple of things before we get into today's episode, which is about one of my favorite topics. Yeah. Um, it's one of the most interesting kind of mysteries out there, conspiracies out there. And I can't believe we haven't covered this yet. I, I didn't even believe Josh when he was like, we we should do this. We haven't done it yet. I was like, what? I know. I know. Especially since we've done so many episodes on aliens and UFOs and o- over you know the past two years or whatever, but we've never talked about kind of the OG UFO alien event. Mm-hmm. And that is Roswell. Yes. So we're going to be talking about the 1947 Roswell UFO incident. And we're not going to be just giving you the, you know, kind of if you go look it up on Google, the mainstream history version of it, because they'll tell you right away it was a hoax or not a hoax that they would say it was a, a weather balloon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the military confirmed that and case closed. We shouldn't be talking about this anymore as something more than just a, a you know, weather balloon. So mm-hmm. we're going to be presenting a lot of the other information that's out there from eyewitnesses as well that actually were on the scene of this crash. So. Mm-hmm. lots to look or forward had to some there involvement in it exactly yeah there's lots of stuff that a lot of people don't know about so i'm very excited to dive deep into that i am too yeah i'm really excited to get into this topic and i can't believe it's taken us so long to do this but i'm honestly glad we waited because sometimes we did some of our best topics in the beginning and i think we weren't you know as experienced enough no. with podcasting no yet, not at all that there's a lot i would like to redo honestly Also, you may have noticed that this episode is a little late. I think it's actually going to be on time for YouTube, but the audio normally comes out on Mondays for Mile Higher on Spotify and iTunes. But um, I had a little bit of an issue this week. You did. (laughs) Tell the the people. Yeah. Well, a lot of you knew that I had had gum surgery like two weeks ago. And when you get gum surgery, you can't brush your teeth. So I wasn't able to, I had to use this like special mouthwash I ended up getting a really bad case of thrush last week. Yuck. Like I went and got a bunch of cavities done. Then I came home and it fully like the thrush just started, which if you've never heard of thrush, it's not fun. What is the bacteria called? It's like candida. Yeah. Yeah. It's always in your mouth and in your body in general. But then if you don't, if the population of it gets out of control, you can get a case of thrush. So because I wasn't brushing like in doing my normal oral hygiene care, I got it and it was bad. It like really fucked up my mouth though. Like it causes all these lesions, lesions in your mouth. Like I have one on my lips still. It hurts really bad. And I have two on my tongue still, but they were all over last week. Like my mouth was torn apart and I could not talk. So I was like, you know what? We're just going to have to wait until this goes away. Yeah, I mean, we don't want you to be in pain while you're podcasting because yeah. literally guys, I mean, it was like bleeding and it was horrible. She was in a lot of pain, surprisingly for mm-hmm. a mouth situation. So yeah, the gum surgery was nothing compared to the thrush. Oh my God. Really bad. But it's doing a lot better now, which mm-hmm. is good. Um, yeah, I've had medicine and everything. So doing fine now. So thanks for your patience. Also, we have a very exciting announcement. Our newest merch collection is now out and this is the mile higher mountain retreat collection we have been working on this actually for months (laughs) we've had a lot of stocking issues when it comes to our merch you guys probably have noticed we haven't put out a new collection in quite a while uh everything is weird right now in the world um the company the supplier that we get stuff from has had all types of weird stocking issues like something will be in stock and then we'll find out it's out of stock so we actually finalized this collection several times and then had to almost start over because we found out everything that we had picked out and worked on was out of stock. So <laughs> this whole like process took a long time. So we appreciate your patience because I know we teased about new merch a while back, <laughs> um, but it's here. It's here and we're going to be able to get it to you guys by Christmas if you want it. All you have to do is order it by December 1st for international viewers and December 14th for domestic shipping. The collection is available now, so go get your hands on it because we do have limited quantity. It's not a pre-order or anything like that. So if you want it, you got to get it. It's only going to be here for a little while. It's just a collection. It's not our entire merch line, and we do have more collections planned in the future. But we wanted to do this fun mountain brand inspired collection that would look like, you know, very subtle merch. We know not all of you want to wear a huge logo or 
you know, wear a podcast logo at all. I just, I understand that some people are not into wearing that type of merch. So we wanted to make something that you could wear that almost just looks like regular clothing and, you know, a normal brand, but then you do a double take and you realize it's mile higher. And I know a lot of other YouTubers and podcasters have been doing this type of style and I always love it. So we decided we wanted to take our own crack at it with some of our favorite mountain brands. And I think it turned out really good. We're very happy with the colors. Yeah. Lots of outdoorsy stuff too. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of stuff to keep you warm and cozy during these winter months. Um, but there's also stuff too, for those that live in warmer climates where, you know, you don't need a, a yeah. warm hoodie or, or something like that. So yeah, we have a few t-shirts. We have a good variety this time. We threw in some t-shirts cause we know we have like Florida people that always want t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have some zip ups. We have crew necks. We have beanies. We have mugs. We have Tumblr too. tumblers. Yeah. Uh, we have a fanny pack. Okay. Okay. Pins. We also have stickers. Yes. Really cute pens, pens and stickers, guys. Pins and stickers. So cute. Those two items have been so requested, pins and stickers. So they're really high quality enamel pins and high quality stickers as well. So we're excited about it. So check it out now at milehiremerch.com. Remember, there are limited quantities and these will not be restocked. So if there is something that you want, make sure to jump on it. But let's go ahead and get into some of our news topics for the week. We have some really interesting things here. Yeah, so the first thing I've got for you is another new study that was published. You know how I love my studies, right? Mm -hmm. So this one was uh, particularly interesting because A, it had to do with the universe and space, but it also has to deal with the human brain. Um, and the fact that, you know, what if I told you that there's actually a lot of similarities between the human brain and the entire universe? I've actually seen something like this on an Instagram meme type account, you know, like, yeah, they, One of those. I've, I think I've seen uh, something like that too mm -hmm. out there where they've kind of like compared the images because the image that we're going to show you is actually really interesting. But let me give you a little backstory on this study. So there is two scientists, basically, Franco Vaza, as well as Alberto Folletti, who have been working on this new study that was recently published this week, which document the extraordinary similarities between the cosmic network of galaxies as well as the complex web of neurons in the human brain. So there's some similarities there. And they published a study um, in the Frontiers in Physics, and it basically showcases that the human brain has roughly 27 orders of magnitude separated in scale, while similarly, the composition of the cosmic web shows comparable levels of complexity and self-organization. So to kind of break that down for you a little bit further and what these similarities are, the brain itself contains an estimated 69 billion neurons. So think about that first. I mean, That's the brain really is hard to wrap your mind 69 around. billion neurons inside this, this noggin. Like that's, <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot. That's an like to think about it. You almost have like a tiny universe in your head. Mm. Cause then look yeah, at this. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Cause the visible universe is composed of at least a hundred billion galaxies strung together like a mesh network. Mm, kind of like the brain. Mm -hmm. And what's even more intriguing is that both galaxies and neurons only account for about 30% of the total masses of the universe and brain. Further, both galaxies and neurons arrange themselves like pearls on a long string. So the other similarities that they found are particularly interesting. So in the case of galaxies, the remaining 70% of the mass of the universe is what we believe to be dark energy. And it works similarly with the human brain in the fact that uh, 70% is water. So in order for the scientists to find these similarities between the universe and the brain, they did, they ran simulations basically. And when you actually run the simulations and you look at images of what is the universe's structure versus a neuron in the brain structure, when you actually look at those physical images, what do you see? Major similarities there as yeah. far as the meshing and the webbing, right? Mm -hmm. It looks incredibly similar. So from a non-scientific perspective, do you think there that's just a coincidence that our brains and neuro pathways look a lot like the universe or is there something else there? I think there could be something else there. I don't understand it well enough to really say what I think completely, but I mean, it seems like, I mean, it could be a coincidence, but I feel like there's probably some more significance there. So does that mean that the galaxy is kind of like a giant brain then? Yeah. The, ra the ratios of, of things are the same as the brain. So like I was saying earlier, the fact that we our brains are literally like little universes inside our, our heads, if, if you look at it that way, because 
physically, if you look at them, their structures, they're very similar. And the, what their actual composition is similar as well to ours as far as the ratios go between, you know, what's actually there and then all the space around it. You might be wondering, like, what's the purpose of doing this study? Like, this is cool and all this galaxy brain theory they came up with, but what's the purpose of it? Well, is there anything we can really learn from that? Well, there's two purposes. One is it's, you know, we're exploring the brain, trying to find out more about it, which will help mm -hmm. with like neurosurgery, neuroscience, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still have not mapped the human brain. If you think about all the technology that we have, the, yeah. the brain is still very much a mystery. Not fully. Yeah, we haven't fully we mapped it quite mapped. a bit. Yeah, I mean, we're able to see a lot of it, but we haven't been able to replicate it. You know, we couldn't, mm -hmm. we don't have all of the information we need in order to create an artificial brain. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like part of the reason why we're looking into this is that eventually they want to make an artificial brain. But the other argument is, you know, cosmology, the universe, you know, finding similarities between our biology and the universe is like, you know, is there more of a connection there? Ultimately, I think all of this research and studies comes back to the biggest mystery of all, where does consciousness lie? And there's, you know, a lot of people that believe consciousness lies in the brain and that the brain is in fact producing the consciousness. You know, if you think about our brains being a little universe, maybe that's true. Maybe our brain somewhere in there contains our consciousness, our soul, whatever you want to call it. You know, a lot of people point to the pineal gland and all that. So it's very possible. Other people say maybe the heart. But uh, it's very interesting, all this new research and studies that are coming out in regards to the brain, I feel. Yeah, I honestly think it's the most important thing that we research is our brains. It's still one of the most misunderstood things in the world. Yeah. You know, the most complex object in our universe. Almost. And what's projecting our reality? Is our, our, yeah. is our brain the one that's actually putting this all together for us? Or is there another source of that and maybe our brain is just like a radio transmitter it's kind of just like mm. bringing in a signal and transmitting it for us mm. so that we can interpret it or is it something more than that it seems like it's something more than that with how complex it is well a lot of people point to the fact that if your brain goes down or you have an issue with your brain a disease or a tumor or something mm -hmm. how that affects your consciousness directly mm -hmm. and that for example like another organ if you lose you lose it completely or you lose the functionality of it that your consciousness often remains. So it seems Most like the consciousness is very much tied to the brain and the fact that people, yeah. I mean, people that go into comas, yeah. how their consciousness changes and how the experiences they have continue. It's, it's all very interesting to me. This, this world of neuroscience and it is, the I'd brain. like to get an expert on to talk I know, more I'd, about this. I would too. It'd be very interesting and talk about near death experiences with them and stuff mm -hmm. and other psychological things that happen mm -hmm. to people that are just wild. But the next thing we got for you is an actual piece of news um, that has kind of been developing over this year. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the Arcebo Observatory before, mm -hmm. but it's the second large, or going to be soon this second largest telescope uh, to ever been built. But the unfortunate thing about it is it's actually going to be demolished because of a weird accident they're calling yeah. it and they're they're not even fully sure i've seen some articles that are saying that they're still investigating how this basically one of the cables if you're looking at it it's this giant dish that's in puerto rico and then on top of it they've got some equipment and then they have these cables these three cables that run from these uh tall towers basically that connect over the top of this dish mm -hmm. so earlier this year one of the cables snapped and damaged the the actual telescope and then recently another one snapped and completely punk put a huge hole into the bottom of it damn these cables must be really heavy yeah well yeah i mean they're holding up serious equipment but yeah it's kind of interesting that they're they're having these issues with it because they they're built to last mm -hmm. obviously a mm -hmm. very very long and for time. such a small part of the telescope to cause such issues yeah I mean, this thing's already survived, you know, the hurricane, I think Maria was the one that, yeah. that hit Puerto Rico. Yep. But the reason why losing this telescope is such a big deal is because this telescope is specifically responsible for looking for other planets, mm -hmm. exoplanets, as well as asteroids. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of you just by the name are like, wait, Arcebo. We've talked about the yeah. Arcebo message before. It's one of my favorite things. But for those that don't know, this telescope was actually the one that in 1974, they beamed 
this radio message from this telescope into deep space, uh, actually towards the globular cluster M13 uh, is where they sent it. And it was an actual message made up of ones and zeros that basically said, hey, we're earthlings. Here's our DNA makeup. Mm -hmm. um, here's some of our you know, biochemicals of life here. Here's what our solar system looks like. Here's, it has a little picture of a satellite, and this is how we sent it. And a lot of people are like, okay, this was just kind of like a celebratory send off, you know, like, oh, we'll just send Funny this in space and, yeah. you know, we probably won't hear back. But we did. But we did hear back in the form of a, a very intricate crop circle, or it wasn't really a crop circle, it was a crop message. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are like, oh, somebody just, you know, went and made that. But it's, it's pretty crazy, um, that particular. Yeah, if you haven't seen our crop circles episode, you probably wouldn't have heard about that response. But yeah, there was a really intricate crop circle done um, as almost a response to this, which, of course, people have argued anyone could have done that, which, okay, yeah, which obviously we have our feelings about crop circles. We won't get into it now, but we truly believe that a lot of them are real because of how I mean, how impossible they would be. No one has been able to recreate them, even with teams of people. Right. You know? And without being seen, without being detected, mm -hmm. without any Middle sort of, of trace night. of being there. Yeah. It still cannot be explained. No, it's definitely one of the world's greatest mysteries. Mm -hmm. Crop circles is mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So the Arcebo telescope was such a big deal because it sent that message into space and we never did get a response from that particular mm -hmm. star cluster that they sent the message to. But as we've talked about many times on the show, all of these fast radio bursts is essentially kind of the same thing of what we sent out there. We're also getting those constantly from mm -hmm. what many scientists would say is just, you know, natural events that are occurring out in the universe. But other people theorize that maybe just maybe it's extraterrestrial civilizations attempting to communicate with us. Or we're just picking up their signals from them talking to each other or, you know, something like that. Exactly. So it's a very sad day that this telescope is going because mm -hmm. Uh, I think the only other super, super large one like that is in China, actually. So this was one that we were able to work with quite a bit. Yeah. NASA was able to work quite a bit with, and now it's going to be demolished. So um, God, pretty, what pretty sad. Of money. I know. And I mean, hopefully they figure out what happened because this thing was built to, again, to last. And I know. I'm surprised you couldn't just repair it. Yeah, well, they they went to go look and see if they could repair it. But unfortunately, the, if it was too dangerous for the crews to go and try to fix it because the whole thing was about to collapse, wow. which they're kind of baffled about. They're like, how did this happen? So it's kind of weird. Mm. There's a little bit a little of bit mystery conspiracy there. there. Maybe a little bit. So I wonder, damaged the telescope to hide something. I wonder if the ground is like damaged or like poor quality soil or something. And it can't like withstand all that shit on it. Yeah. <laughs> Who it's knows? possible. Yeah, that's possible. It kind of looks that way from the picture. Mm -hmm. So yeah, unfortunately, I was actually, that was a place I wanted if when we go visit Puerto Rico one day, I wanted to go see this telescope because it's mm. known as the alien hunting telescope because it's looking for planets with life on it. And now we don't have it. So, well, you'd think we'd make a new one. Hopefully they do. Or maybe we do Hopefully have right one. here in Colorado so I can go, <laughs> go visit. That'd be convenient. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we won't be able to see this guy. Nope. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the Roswell UFO incident. But before we do, I'd like to thank our first sponsor for today. Life can be stressful even under normal circumstances. 2020 has challenged even the most difficult times of life, it seems. You need stress relief that goes beyond quick fixes. That's Headspace. Headspace is your daily dose of mindfulness in the form of guided meditations in an easy-to-use app. Headspace is one of the only meditation apps advancing the field of mindfulness and meditation through clinically validated research. So whatever the situation, Headspace really can help you feel better. Overwhelmed? Headspace has a three-minute SOS meditation for you. Need some help falling asleep? Headspace has wind-down sessions their members swear by. And for parents, Headspace even has morning meditations you can do with your kids. Headspace's approach to mindfulness can reduce stress, improve sleep, and boost focus. And increase your overall sense of well-being. Since I've been using Headspace, I've really been enjoying a number of things with their app. Specifically, I love that they have a bunch of different music playlists that you can actually put on to help relieve stress. One of my favorites has been the Lo-Fi Times playlist that they've got. I also really love the fact that they include stress release workouts, actually. I did one of their stress relief workouts, and it really did help 
lower my stress levels, and it's all video, so you can follow along right on your phone. Headspace is backed by 25 published studies on its benefits. It has 600,000 five-star reviews and over 60 million downloads. Headspace makes it easy for you to build a life-changing meditation practice with mindfulness that works for you on your schedule anytime, anywhere. You deserve to feel happier and Headspace is meditation made simple. Go to headspace.com slash mile higher. That's headspace.com slash mile higher for a free one month trial with access to Headspace full library of meditations for every situation. This is the best deal offered right now. Head to headspace.com slash mile higher today. All right, let's go ahead and get into Roswell. So did you know that in the last six months of 1947, there were over 300 UFO sightings all across the United States? That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. That is a lot. And I mean, you got to think about this time period, though, too. Mm -hmm. Like 1947 is, you know, a few years after World War II and also the beginning of the Cold War. So it wasn't like probably entirely abnormal for there to be stuff flying over all the time but yeah and some of the planes were made out of that silver reflective material that a lot of people were confused about well it was around the time too that the u.s was really coming out with spy planes and everything like Mm -hmm. that so there was a lot of new technology that was being used during this time period but in secret technology but as far as like ufo sightings and referencing flying saucers specifically Uh, There was actually quite a few sightings during that year, which is kind of interesting. And there were pictures taken of some of these sightings. Um, Newspaper called these objects in the sky flying discs. That summer, the military dispatched fighter planes to help search for those flying discs, speculating that they could have been sent from a foreign power to infiltrate or spy on the U.S., Reports came in from 38 states, including California, Washington, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Idaho, Kentucky, and New Mexico. Yeah, what's interesting, too, is that I believe there was another crash that there's actually other crashes that were reported Mm -hmm. that just never really got popular like Roswell did. Uh, I think one in Missouri specifically was uh, happened uh, right around that same time. Uh, so it wasn't, uh, it was a definitely a hot year for UFO sightings and, and crashes specifically. But today we're specifically referencing the Roswell UFO event. So we're going to tell you what happened in Roswell. So the story really starts with a local rancher named Mac Brazel, who was working as a foreman on the J.B. Foster Ranch, which is about 30 miles away from Roswell. So with the Roswell event, there's a lot of sort of lore around it. There's a lot of different stories, Mm -hmm. a lot of different opinions, because there is definitely, we don't have like a play by play of how everything happened in Roswell. But according to the story, Mac, uh, it was a a night in early July of 1947 when there was a big thunderstorm. And apparently that night he heard a big explosion. And I mean, being on a ranch, that's totally weird. So He was like, okay, I'm going to go take a look at that the next day when the storm has passed. So that's when he goes out the next day to kind of search and see what had happened the previous night. What was that explosion he heard? And that's when he comes across the crash sites. And it was just like out in the field, these large discs and then a bunch of debris. And Mac later told newspapers that he saw a large area of bright wreckage made up of rubber strips tin foil and rather tough paper and also some sticks. And I mean, this is a rancher. He doesn't know what he's looking at, but like (laughs) that, that description sounds like what he found a pile of trash out (laughs) in the field. Like (laughs) seriously. And I think the reason why his description of the debris and crash site was so seemingly so simple is because when he first went out there out to his fields and discovered that there was this crash site out there, he said that when he had was basically hurting his animals and his animals wouldn't go over the debris, like they would just stay back from it. Like there was something about it that was scaring them or just physically keeping them from going over it. And he ended up having to take the animals quite a bit farther around it. And I think that's when he realized that, okay, there's something more going on here and perhaps there's radiation or something harmful that would keep i mean because think about it if you saw a crash site you know you'd probably stay back from it quite a ways you know you probably want to just go start walking through it unless you know you thought it was safe and when his animals freaked out that kind of freaked him out too so he was kind of standing around it at first at least trying to figure out what it was yeah 
And it's interesting, like Josh said, this story is really hard to, you know, figure out what actually happened because there's, you know, the the story put out the story and then there's just a bunch of eyewitness reports as well, which can, sometimes cannot be verified. verified yeah. Um, but there are reports that Mac had found debris earlier than July 5th and may have just waited weeks to report it and just held on to it. Yeah. So, and, and that's the whole thing is we don't have exact dates and times like of when all this, when he actually discovered it. Uh, Cause I don't think we have any sort of like firsthand record of, Mac Brazel and like a witness, you know, eyewitness testimony of that, what he actually saw on record. And he also brought his wife, his son and his daughter out to the crash, the crash site to gather as much of the debris that he, as they could. But that's interesting because you'd think they would have interviewed them a little more. We'd kind of know how they felt about it. They experienced it too. They saw it. Yeah. You would think that that would be like front page everywhere and that, there would have been this big media thing, but, but maybe they're afraid to right. say anything. Exactly. Um, Mac didn't have a phone, so he stored the flying disc on his property until he could get in touch with the local sheriff's department. Right, because I, I think when all this goes down, it's kind of like Fourth of July time, mm -hmm. which is well, it's right after Fourth yeah, of July. Right. Well, if he had found it earlier, it could have been a few days earlier, even a week or two earlier. Mm -hmm. Could have. We don't know how long, right, right. or exactly at what point this crashed. But we do know that on July 7th, Mac talked to Sheriff George Wilcox and told him about the items that he found. And from there, the information was passed through the chain of command. Because in this area, there is an air force base. So I think the first, his first thought was okay, that he found something that came from the sky crashed. It's gotta be something related to the air force. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why Sheriff Wilcox contacted the air force to have them look into it. Specifically, he contacted Colonel Butch Blanchard, of the U.S. Air Force at the Roswell Army Airfield about the flying disc. And he briefed his superior officer, General Roger Ramey, and then he ordered Major Jesse Marcel, an intelligence officer for the 509th Bombardment Group, to examine the crash site and pick up the flying disc and other things from Max Ranch. So right away, they're like, okay, we got to go mm -hmm. see what, what's <laughs> going on out there and confiscate whatever it is. And the 509th Bombardment Group dropped the atomic bombs during World War II, and they're located on the military base in Roswell. Very interesting because if you, you know, we, I think we've talked about this before, but there's been a lot of instances where UFO sightings have been prevalent near both Air Force bases, but specifically bases with bombs or nuclear mm -hmm. weapons. Yeah, that uh, is very interesting. Where they've actually disabled the nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very interesting that these craft happened to go down near where this particular group that had the atomic bombs at one point mm -hmm. uh, or dropped the atomic bombs during world war two. So yeah, the relationship between alien life, I guess you could say, or UFO incidents and military related or anything to do with bombing. Yeah. It's very interesting because it makes you, I mean, we have proof of this too. It's not like this is just mm. theories that we're making no, up. I mean, there's multiple times. Yeah. And there's multiple people who've worked at these missile silos who said, Oh yeah, our system, we were trying to test mm -hmm. and it just completely shut down. Mm -hmm. So it seems whatever these UFOs are or whoever's piloting them mm -hmm. doesn't want us to be shooting off these weapons. Even last week, or was it last week, the week before when I talked about the Solway spaceman Yeah, and how they had that base in Australia where all of a sudden they saw that strange man figure and they had to cancel it. it yeah. Totally interfered with their testing. Yeah. It's interesting. It is very interesting. But anyway, Colonel Sheridan Cavett went along to pick up the disc with Jesse Marcel and inspect the site. And then Jesse briefed Butch on what exactly that they had found. And he told him about how the debris from the crash site was unlike anything he'd ever seen before. And that there were strange metal objects that were so thin that they could be folded up like cloth or even balled up. And when he put them down, these objects sprang back into their original form with no creases, folds, or cracks. There was also long, thin eye beams with unfamiliar purple symbols on them that resembled a form of hieroglyphs. It looks like hieroglyphs. So yeah, this is a sketch of the actual uh, piece of, or the eye beam that Jesse Marcel reportedly saw at the crash site. And from just looking at it, I mean, strange symbols that don't really make sense at first glance. And clearly this material, I mean, I don't know of any other material like this even now that you can 
you know, fold ball up, crum, you know, crum, mm-hmm. crumple up and then just throw it down on the ground and it goes flat again. Yeah. It almost sounds like aluminum foil, but obviously it doesn't unfold no. itself or re, you know, go back to its shape. It no, stays there's where, how it creases in it. Yeah. Still. Yeah, I know. I haven't seen anything like that. It almost sounds like one of those blankets, you know? Yeah. That they use it in emergencies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't spring out either. No. That's weird. Not without creases. So definitely the materials that Jesse and Marcel observed at the crash site were very unusual. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure we're making them think, hmm, there's something about these that is very special. And if you're at all into ancient astronaut theories, then you are particularly interested in these hieroglyphs because it definitely makes you think, hmm, could there be a connection to one of our ancient cultures, maybe ancient Egypt? Yeah, I mean, there's I mean, there's tons of ancient cultures that have this type of uh, symbolic writing, mm-hmm. you know, so but Egypt, especially with their hieroglyphics, could there be a connection? Mm-hmm. Maybe. Mm-hmm. What Butch didn't know is that Jesse had taken some of the objects that he found home to show his wife and son, Jesse Jr., who remembers his father saying that these objects that he found were not of this earth. And then on July 8th, Butch ordered that Lieutenant Walter Hott, the public information officer, issue a press release. And the release told the public that the military had recovered a flying saucer from the crash site, which immediately sounds very intriguing to yeah. people. And, and if you want to, we'll put a link. There's actually an interview uh, on Dr. Stephen Greer's channel of Walter Hott uh, talking That's about cool. this press release and how it was. I mean, hearing it from his mouth mm-hmm. and seeing his face while he's telling you this information that, yeah, we were ordered to like we put this out. But then we were literally ordered, you know, to do something different. So. And also, according to this press release, the flying disc and the other items that were examined at the Roswell Army Airfield were then loaned to higher headquarters. Basically just taking it to another base is what Mm -hmm. that means, Mm -hmm. Uh, because we believe that a lot of the wreckage and, you know, other things they recovered were taken to another base uh, up north, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. It was soon after the press release was put out that the Roswell Daily Record ran the story. Roswell Army Field captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. And the article referenced the flying disc, but there were no details about the UFO or the crash. But just the very fact that we have historical record of, you know, this article about the Air Force in Roswell Mm -hmm. capturing a flying saucer is truly amazing. And I think that's why most people hold on to this one, Mm -hmm. especially is because they literally put out exactly what happened in the beginning. Yeah, they did. And then within 24 hours, the military is like, oh shit, that was a bad idea. So they completely retracted this version of events, what they had just put out. Because after the story broke, General Roger Ramey ordered the items recovered from the crash be brought to him immediately in Fort Worth, Texas, as he wanted to inspect them himself. General Ramey and his staff examined the so-called UFO And along with a base weather officer, they agreed that the debris that they had received was in fact just pieces of a weather balloon. After coming to this conclusion, they then ordered another press release be sent out immediately to correct and erase the existing story about them finding a flying saucer. Then they had Major Jesse Marcel, who was the officer who actually picked up the flying desk from Max Ranch. They had him do basically a photo op where he is seen inspecting materials that I guess were from the debris field that were relabeled to weather balloons. And that was their story. (laughs) The weather balloon story. Yep. Yeah. But I mean, by this point, the UFO story had made its way all around the world. Yeah. I mean, mean, that's huge news. Oh yeah. (laughs) Especially for back then people were into it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, right from the beginning, a lot of people just did not accept the whole weather balloon story just sounds pretty ridiculous. Like I'm sure that well, how'd guy, you go from a flying saucer to a weather balloon? Very different objects. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know you're not really fooling anybody with that, but they tried, they tried by releasing another press release on July 9th and the Roswell daily record ran a follow-up story and the headline read harassed rancher who located saucer. Sorry. He told about it. Sorry. He told about it. What a I, I like how they low key didn't change the headline though. They were like, well, he was sorry he found the saucer and talked about it, but what? there was still a saucer. It's kind of funny, even after that second press release where they're like, "Is it's a weather balloon. Mm-hmm. Like, they could have ran weather balloon found actually, not saucer. Yeah. 
but they still were like, Rancher is sorry. <laughs> Let's blame him for all of this. <laughs> yeah, pretty funny. But in the article, Mac Brazel, the harassed rancher, explained that the debris he found was just rubber strips, some tin foil, some thick scraps of paper, and some uh, sticks. It was all it was. No big deal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, after the second story was ran, many other newspapers started running similar retraction stories about what the military had said. Um, and they were talking about, you know, oh, well, there was a weather balloon out that night because, you know, there was that storm. So, you know, it was likely just a high altitude balloon that went down. But I'm, oh, I, fuck. But that happens all the time. Like, yeah. I, why would this have even been a story? Like when it was really a weather balloon, this whole Roswell thing would have shut down a lot faster. I just don't see why a rancher would make something up like that. Like Mm -hmm. why would he make up that it was a a disc Mm -hmm. and why wouldn't he just say, yeah, guys, I found a weather balloon. Can you come (laughs) scrape it off my land, please? And the fact that his animals wouldn't walk over it. It's kind of interesting. Well, that's the thing is like a lot of the real story of Roswell has been kind of like brushed under Mm -hmm. the rug and they've Mm -hmm. tried to replace the narrative with it was this weather balloon and, you know, it was the weather that night and, Mm -hmm. you know, it was just a misprint by the Roswell Daily Record about finding a saucer. Okay. But this is where things get interesting with the Roswell story because there's a lot of things with this that are a lot of people say are conspiratorial and that there's not really a lot of evidence to back this up. And one thing that plays a huge role in this whole story is Majestic 12. Mm -hmm. Now, Majestic 12 was a supposed group that was created by President Truman by executive order. And what's really interesting about Majestic 12 is that most people would say this is just all fake. It's all bullshit. Yet the FBI has countless documents Mm -hmm. with memo after memo after memo with names redacted from these documents. And they literally have written over most of them bogus. And they're just like, this is bogus, yet we'll keep it in our archives. Bogus. Yeah, look at this. this yeah, is we just in- spent all this time typing this up as a joke. Who typed up who that you that would imply that there's a whole group of people that are that fake this Majestic 12 organization. I mm-hmm. mean, how much and time for what? and for what? So the government tells us that Majestic 12 is not real, never existed, completely made up. Yet there's so much evidence that Majestic 12 really actually was a thing because Majestic 12 was the code name for a group of government officials, including members of the military and scientists who President Truman brought together to say, hey, guys, let's find out what happened in Roswell and let's look into this whole UFO phenomenon. What are these things that we're seeing? What who's piloting these craft Mm -hmm. in 1952 Majestic 12 released their first annual report, which talked about the Roswell incident. And this is where a lot of the information that we're going to be covering comes from is from these memos, at least a lot of the fine details of the Roswell event. Cause I mean, as a whole, I think it's pretty obvious what the two sides are, right? It's mm-hmm. there was either a weather balloon or some other type of ordinary object that crashed in, you know, near Roswell. And that's what everybody found. But then the other argument is, Oh yes, there was absolutely extraterrestrial craft that looked like flying saucers that crashed at Roswell. And well, it's just, Yeah. And I'd say that there's another huge argument as well that people make that it was some type of, you know, other countries spying on us, something like that. And I know that one particular theory that has held really strong is that it was Stalin, you know. Yeah. It was like enemy Stalin. Enemy Stalin. Yeah. Stallion. (laughs) Stallion. (laughs) It was, you know, the Soviet Union. Yeah. And I've heard some, you know, I guess you could say whistleblowers or people that have inside knowledge say that that's what it is or you know but there, there's no proof right so yeah i'd say people are kind of broken into three categories there's the weather balloon people who just believe the narrative there's the people who think it was something secret when it comes to the military military and then testing there's people who really think it was a ufo aliens yeah. i fall somewhere between those last two yeah part yeah. of me does feel like it could have been something military related because there was just so much going on at that time yeah but i don't know i'm i i I wouldn't say I'm completely convinced of that. <laughs> well, let me let me continue with some of this information that we acquired through these Majestic 12 documents. And again, could be completely fake, but the information is pretty specific and it's very, very interesting. One of the, the big pieces of information that we've retrieved from the Majestic 12 group was the fact that on that particular night when the crashes occurred, 
there was not just one crash, but there was three. And that on radar, they actually had three targets uh, on radar before they crashed. And therefore, there was three separate crash sites, according to the reports, as well as five recovered bodies. Apparently, two of the bodies that they found were in a severely damaged escape cylinder, almost like an escape pod or something. And three bodies were found some distance away from that cylinder. The report said the bodies had suffered from some sudden decompression and heat suffocation. The report also described the flying saucer as a plan form space vehicle, meaning crescent shaped. So if this is bogus documents, then why would someone spend their time typing all this out? And why do they have president names? Why is <laughs> Truman in this? Like who's who? It was like, all right, I'm going to write the best story, right? It's called Majestic 12. I think it's funny that the way that they decided to deal with it was just write bogus all over it. Right? <laughs> it's so weird. And it's on the FBI's vault. Like, yeah, that's... And why keep bogus documents up to confuse people if it's bogus? <laughs> yeah, De- delete it. Like, Well, they know that people would be like, where the fuck did this document go? Right. They'll be like, oh, bogus. they deleted it. So clearly it's real. So they'd rather just keep it publicly up there that it's bogus. But here's the thing is that. It's not just like we have no idea. There's a ton of people that are whistleblowers and government insiders that have come out and spoken about this group from way mm-hmm. back, you know, during that time period that, yeah, yeah. there was in fact. I mean, mm-hmm. it seems pretty plausible, yeah. right? That yeah. the, the president or anybody in a high office of you know, government would be interested in UFOs and things that mm-hmm. are in our airspace that we don't know what they're doing there. Yeah. Know? It seems like it would be a top priority. And why would they want to hide that? We would have something like that right. as a citizen. I assume that they have things like this. So right. I don't understand all the secrecy. Yeah. I guess it, maybe they think it's admitting that there are UFOs or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. It, and that, I mean, that's why there's conspiracy around it. That's why we're also interested is because, Clearly there's something more to this than just government testing or something like that. I mean, why they would just be like, Hey guys, we're testing. This is what time we're doing it at, but they don't. Uh -uh. So according to majestic 12, the three crash sites in New Mexico were called landing zones and landing zone. One was about 75 miles Northwest of Roswell landing zone. Two was located near Trinity site where the U S government had tested the first atomic bomb two years earlier. Hmm, Coincidence there. Uh I think not landing zone three was on one of the Apache tribes reservations and that aircraft hit the ground so hard. There was basically nothing left in July, 1947, the U S government agency called the interplanetary phenomenon unit investigated the wreckage from the three crash sites. The report said that some of the bodies found near landing zone one quote, looked as if they had been dissected like a frog and that it wasn't clear if army field surgeons had been responsible or not. The special unit also said animal parts may have been found on the vehicle that crashed in landing zone two. The animal parts were allegedly inside a capsule that kept them well preserved. The capsule may have also been ejected from the spacecraft near landing zone one. General Ramey, who issued the second press release retracting the flying saucer story, was placed under strict orders by President Truman to deny any existence of UFOs or alien life forms. What's also interesting is that six years earlier, before Roswell, President Truman and FDR had already dealt with an alleged UFO crash site. On April 12, 1941, a crescent-shaped UFO crashed in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and military personnel from the Missouri Institute for Aeronautics went to the crash site, and they found three small bodies that were completely identical. These bodies were described as quote, not from this world. So again, all this information is coming from Majestic 12. And that's why you probably haven't heard this before. If you don't know about Majestic 12, Mm -hmm. because this isn't included in any of the other narratives or stories about Roswell. It's completely left out because it's bogus. Mm. (laughs) Bogus. I love how they use that word. So after all of that, the story kind of ended up dying out because, you know, they put out this narrative and the people that were trying to push the truth were kind of eventually forgotten about and people just moved on. You know, it just became one of those things that some people believe was a conspiracy. It's just kind of like almost become like you were saying lore. Yeah. Legend. Just a part of our lore and and especially Roswell's lore and New Mexico's lore. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until 1978 that the story was resurrected by UFO researcher and nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman. 
And he ended up interviewing Major Jesse Marcel, who is now retired, about what he really found there on the ranch. And when he was sent to retrieve the disc and analyze the crash site, what he actually thought of everything. And during this interview, Jesse told Stanton that he believed that he had definitely found something that was not a weather balloon. And in another interview, he said that it was a metal unlike anything he'd ever seen. When he held it inside his hands, it felt like he was holding nothing. And it was only the width of the foil inside a cigarette pack. But a sludge hammer bounced right off of it. That's crazy. I mean, that's super strong. That's some serious stuff that I don't think we even have on this planet. Yeah. Are Metal you thinking like of L- Element 115? Yeah. Something like that. But I don't think, I think Element 115 is, uh, the properties of it is different. Oh, from really? that but i mean maybe yeah maybe there is some type of element undiscovered on this planet that they found but that was you know that's possibility or it's not from this planet at all isn't it hard to wrap your mind around things that aren't of this planet like unless we have seen it or experienced it it's so hard to imagine that it's real or yeah accept that it's real or could be Jesse said that he was familiar with working with all types of metals and materials used to build aircrafts. And as an intelligence officer, he had never seen this material before. Jesse had actually graduated from the Army's Air Force Training Command in radar technology. And as a distinguished member of the 509th Bombardment Group, obviously there's no reason to doubt his knowledge or his credibility, right? I mean, he's clearly a smart guy. He holds a, a decently high rank in the military. So why would he be making up these, you know, Im- details about this materials that he recovered from the ranch. And he was saying over and over again, this is not of earth. That's what I'm quite sure of. So it makes sense that if you find something that's not of this earth that the military be like, let's not tell people yeah. about what we found and let's see if we can use it to our benefit. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that's what the military does. So yeah, or the like military a industrial reasons they wouldn't want us to know. Right. Exactly. As a UFO researcher, though, Stanton Freeman didn't stop with just interviewing Jesse Marcel. He actually went out and interviewed anyone he could find who was involved in the initial discovery, including the rancher Mac Brazel, Sheriff George Wilcox, Lieutenant Walter Hott, and Colonel Butch Blanchard. And through his investigation and after talking to all these people, he truly believed that he had uncovered a massive cover-up by the U.S. military of the Roswell incident. It looks like it. And those he interviewed revealed details withheld from the public about the crash site, the materials found there, an alien spacecraft, and the alien bodies. So he decided to call the cover-up a cosmic water gate. And in 1980, the book The Roswell Incident was published by Charles Berlitz and William Moore. And in 1989, the stories featured on Unsolved Mysteries. Of course, that's a great show. They should have Why? called it Cosmic Watergate. That's yeah, a good name. That is a great name. Good marketing. Several more books about the incident have been released, including The Day After Roswell, released in 1997 by Colonel Philip Corso. Another very interesting guy. Lots of interview footage of him on Dr. Greer's site uh, regarding Roswell as well. I mean, he's he literally saw mm-hmm. uh, one of the bodies, the alien bodies, he it's claims. Like, you think this guy's just lying? You think all these people are just making this up? No. And I mean... Obviously, you got to be careful when people make extraordinary claims. Yeah, but, of course. But if they have something to stand on mm-hmm. or evidence to back up those claims, mm-hmm. I mean, the guys are in the military. They were around the area where this wreckage was taken to. Mm-hmm. So, And it's not just coming back to one person. That's what I'm always wary of, you know? Right. As long as it's multiple people corroborating it, corroborating it and the, um, the news report, I think yeah. that just says a lot. Yeah. Well, and especially with uh, Colonel Corso, uh, he actually worked directly under uh, basically President Eisenhower. It was handpicked by him to head up a bunch of these committees and things like that relating to Army research and development and things like that. So, and, and this is verifiable. So somebody that's extremely verifiable is making claims of, I saw these bodies and they were recovered from the Roswell site. Mm-hmm. What are you going to, I mean, you got to take... Take it, you know, take it for what it is, obviously, but I I believe he lends a little bit more credibility than just somebody random. You yeah, know? So. I would agree. But according to Philip, while he was working in the Pentagon, he was asked to do some very interesting things. He was instructed to bring these artifacts to specific people working for American corporations, contracted to reverse engineer the materials as a top secret national security priority. And no one in Congress or the general public knew about these efforts. And interestingly enough, NASA was created on July 29th, 1958, and it's often speculated that it was launched as a public front to to allow for these secret operations to go on, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. that's 
a lot of people, and I mean, I do to some extent believe that NASA is just a giant front for all things space and that, you know, what's really happening is in the secret programs and behind the scenes and then the public just is never aware about it, aware of it. And so, you know, NASA tries to keep us happy with, Mm -hmm. you know, Oh, look, we sent some people to ISS. Woo. You know, yeah, we've been doing that for a long time. Like, you know, we're just launching people into space yet. There's could be all this technology that they recover from Roswell being used without our knowledge, which is kind of scary. Thing Imagine about. if Elon had this technology in his hands, what he would do with it. Mm, I'd be scared. So I was gonna say that guy's about to little, like if anyone's leaving, he's leaving. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely going to GTFO <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Well, it makes you wonder, you know, we have so much of our military budget going to who knows what I'm yeah. sure they have all types of stuff. We don't know about. Yeah, I mean, the DOD gets like $700 billion. Yeah, it's fucking insane. And I think there's a large portion of that that we have no idea where it goes. There's mm-hmm. no... No, there is. There's, it's literally, no, there's proof. We don't know where it goes. Well, can you believe that the DOD wasn't audited for years? Up mm-hmm. until like the last couple of years, it's been audited. Mm-hmm. But they are literally not accountable to the money that they're given. <laughs> like, that wild? They can go anywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and it does. So there's a lot of secret shit happening that the public will never know about or probably could even dream of that's happening behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. What's interesting to me, though, is that what we do know from people like Philip Corso, Jesse Marcel, and many other government insiders or people who used to be in the military that have come forward to talk about Roswell and the information that they knew about it is the fact that it, it seemed like right off the bat that the whole purpose of keeping it hidden was so that they could use this technology back engineer it, reverse engineer it and Mm -hmm. use it for their own purpose, you know, war and weapons and things like that. But also, you know, hiding the alien bodies as well was, was also part of the plan because they wanted to obviously study these entities and figure out what they were, what they're made of and, you know, figure out how they tick and then use them also for experimental purposes and creating hybrid beings, things like that. Uh, which a lot of people think there's probably secret programs out there that are experimenting with DNA, animal DNA, Mm -hmm. human DNA, possibly alien DNA in order to make some type of hybrid being of some sort for whatever purpose. Some scary shit. With that being said, let's go ahead and dive into some of the theories about Roswell a little bit deeper. But before we get into that, I want to thank our last sponsors for today. With everything going on in the world, it's been extremely important to utilize the services that provide delivery. And one of those services that we absolutely love that we use almost every day, it feels like, is Postmates. Whether it's ordering some of our favorite meals from our local restaurants, or if we happen to run out of pet food, Postmates will go to PetSmart or King Supers or wherever we need pet food from whenever we need it, which is awesome because Postmates is available 24-7 and always comes in clutch when you need it most. Not only that, Postmates also offers a pickup option, which we've used in the past to order takeout from some of our favorite restaurants, uh, which is really helpful right now because we got to keep our local restaurants in business. So if you can order out and do it safely, why not? The best thing about Postmates, though, is it's delivered within the hour, which is absolutely awesome and really have never had any issues with Postmates whatsoever. We love it. So if you haven't checked out Postmates yet, what are you doing? For a limited time, Postmates is giving our listeners $5 off your first five orders for your first seven days. To save $5 on your first five deliveries, download the app and use code MileHire. That's code MileHire for $5 off your first five orders when you download the Postmates app or sign up online. Anything you need, anytime you need it, Postmate that shit. Today's episode is also kindly sponsored by Care Of. Care of is a wellness brand that makes it easy to maintain your health goals with a customized vitamin plan that helps you feel your best today and supports you long term. All of care of's products are formulated with good for you, clean ingredients that are backed by science. Care of is super transparent about their research and sourcing behind all of their products. And the way it works is they have a five minute online quiz that asks you questions about your lifestyle and health concerns to help you address your specific wellness goals. It's kind of like getting a one-on-one consultation with a nutritionist, all without leaving your house. And as the seasons are changing, it's important to get ahead of taking care of your immune health. Did you know it takes 30 days for your body to adapt to new nutrients? So now is a great time to update your vitamin and wellness routines to help support your immune system this fall and winter. 
I like care of because it's just so easy. I love that they're individual packs and I don't have to get out each bottle or set up one of those daily medicine reminders for the week with all my vitamins in it. It's just all in its convenient little pack. So check it out today at takecareof.com and enter code milehire 50 to get 50% off your first care of order. That's 50% off your first care of order at takecareof.com and enter code milehire 50. So obviously the main theory that most people believe is that Roswell, what happened at Roswell was an alien extraterrestrial vehicle that crashed down Mm -hmm. and was recovered. But there are a lot of other theories out there that people have put forward, researchers and authors specifically have written books about. I mean, there's so much Mm -hmm. media and materials about Roswell and, you know, different people's takes on it. And I mean, I think it's good to cover all of it because again, we can't really verify any of this. We can't verify majestic 12 and all that information that they gave. But, um, I think it's, I I think it's best to, you know, look at everything from like an aerial view and then, you know, make your own personal decision on what you think really happened. Yeah. And one thing I was going to say too, if you want even more than this podcast, cause we definitely won't be able to fit it in, but there's a couple interviews that are on YouTube under the U.S. National Archives account, including an interview with this guy named Glenn Davis that I watched earlier today. And he was actually the person that worked, I believe, at the morgue. It's like 41 minutes long. I only watched a little bit. But he said that they called him from the Army base and asked them for a little coffin that could conceal like smell in it or something and make sure nothing would ever get into it. Yeah, yeah. For like a miniature person. And he had all these details about how they were asking him how the embalming process could affect it or change the chemistry of it. And they wanted to do testing on it. Um, so he has a whole interview. There's another woman, um, Marilyn Strickland, Alice Knight. There's there's interviews with a bunch of people, Gerald Anderson, and they're they're long interviews. And these people are clearly not just making all of this up. I mean, I think it's important to see these interviews if you can, because it really, I don't know, something about hearing it from people who have experienced it themselves. You can make I feel a better judgment. Right, right. You can at least look them in their in their eyes and see, you know do you think they're being deceitful or are they telling the truth? I mean, Mm -hmm. a lot of these people, I'm like, why would, why come forward? Why say this stuff unless it was true? And a lot of them are quite older when they're coming forward. It's like, why would they do this? They're not doing it for clout. No, you know, I mean, I don't know. It's pretty compelling stuff. Yeah, it really is. But one of the other theories that's out there was put forward in a book called area 51 an uncensored history of America's top secret military base. Uh, It was written by reporter Annie Jacobson, and she believes that the Roswell crash was a Russian invasion of American airspace because in 1947, the Soviets didn't have access to nuclear technology yet. So Joseph Stalin did what he believed was the next best thing, and he sent an aircraft to crash on U.S. soil that resembled an alien spaceship, apparently. And that's an interesting theory. It is. I wouldn't rule that out. I mean, that does sound kind of compelling. It does. That's the other theory that really gets me. You know, because I mean, it does happen right in this time period yeah. when all of this stuff was going on in the world. That, and it could explain a lot of the sketchiness. Why yeah. they're acting so weird. Right. About why it. would they would want to cover it up? Because that would be a major. I mean, imagine if we got that news today, like a Russian aircraft spy craft yeah. was shot down in New Mexico. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, it would cause panic for some people. I think it would definitely worry you like, oh, are our skies really safe. But according to Annie, she said that there were bodies on the aircraft, but they weren't aliens. And her reasoning for why they weren't aliens was because they were actually victims of Joseph Mengele, who did medical experiments on children, I believe, that were deformed and disfigured, and they put them in the aircraft. So sick, but doesn't surprise me. And so they were saying that basically when these bodies were discovered, because according to uh, Philip Corso, the bodies were like kind of spindly beings, not, you know, no hair, very, you know, your typical gray alien type of look, you know, not, not, not really human like, but smaller in figure, a couple feet tall. And so Annie's theory was that maybe they were, you know, had progeria or something like that because somebody with that condition, I guess might look like an alien to somebody, but Maybe. I don't know. I feel like somebody would, I feel like these guys who retrieved the crash, they would be like, oh yeah, this is a human that's just got mm-hmm. a deformity or something like that. So that, that theory holds up to the point where how do you explain the alien bodies, right? right? Mm-hmm. Which again, 
the official narrative says there was never any alien bodies. So most <laughs> yeah. people would be like, what are you talking about? That's the, if you even believe that they're real. Yeah. Right. Another ufologist and cryptozoologist, Nick Redfern, had a different theory, though. He believed that the bodies on the aircraft were victims of a U.S. medical experiment that had gone wrong. And he theorized that the United States was experimenting with the effects of high altitudes on humans and that they used Japanese prisoners of war, other prisoners and children with birth defects to conduct these experiments. And when the aircrafts crashed, they had to cover up what really happened. That's an interesting theory. I mean, now that we know what happened with MK ultra and these other projects and how unethical mm -hmm. they were yeah. and the things that they were doing on innocent people, you can't really put anything past the military or government on what they might do in order to run experiments and testing of their technology. Right. No, that's so true. And that could be another reason why they're hiding so many things. Right. Because that would look so bad. Oh yeah. The whole and country. Maybe that would that. explain why they needed a the little casket. I mean, it's a possibility. It I is. I not rule it out. It is. I don't know. I'd like to know more about that theory. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, though, the aircrafts may have just been weather balloons and the officers initially misidentified the materials they found. In 1994, there was intense public pressure on the Air Force to explain what really happened in 1947. And in response, they released a report admitting to a cover-up. But the report wasn't about aliens and UFOs. It was about a top-secret military operation that was going on. They claim that the items found at the crash site in 1947 from a weather balloon developed under a secret program called Project Mogul. And this program was started at Columbia University uh, by Dr. Maurice Ewing in response to the heightened fear of a nuclear war in the U.S. in the 1940s. And through this uh, experiment, they hoped to develop a sophisticated airborne monitoring system using the same science of microphones to detect sound waves from an explosion thousands of miles away. And the system could be then used to detect nuclear tests being done in Russia from American soil. And the weather balloons developed under Project Mogul were tested in multiple locations. One of them was in New Mexico around the same time as the Roswell incident in 1947. Now, these balloons do look a lot different than the wreckage that I've seen. Uh, the balloons were 650 feet long with listening and sensory devices attached to the tail end. And the U.S. military theorized that someone not familiar with Project Mogul could think these balloons were a UFO, of course. What's interesting, though, is in February of 1994, New Mexico Congressman Steve Schiff requested an audit from the U.S. General Accounting Office of all the Roswell incident government records. And he was like into it, Schiff. He was like, we are going to get the truth. Yeah, and I mean, he was kind of skeptical of it. Um, yeah, he wa wanted yeah. to like prove that it was... There was no cover-up yeah. and stuff, yeah. And he hoped that the audit would conclude that all the records had been appropriately handled. And the Air Force published the report from the audit in 1995. It was called the Roswell Report Fact Versus Fiction in the New Mexico Desert. And it found that the records proved the crash was a weather balloon developed through Project Mogul. There was no evidence of misconduct or records of alien life forms, foreign materials, or UFOs. And according to the report, the original press release that was put out uh, in 1947 was deemed an overreaction taken out of context by the public. And the press release used the term flying saucer, which in 1947 was a relatively new term that didn't necessarily refer to an alien spacecraft. So, I mean, again, they're just going to try through this report to completely mm -hmm. just kill that whole, this whole theory that it was an alien spacecraft, of course. So in addition to that first report, the air force put out, they then put out another report called the Roswell report case closed which was released in 1997. And this report attempted to explain away why, you know, some of these claimed aliens were recovered were really never recovered because they weren't aliens at all. They said that in the mid 1950s, the military was experimenting with parachutes through operation high dive. And to test the effects on humans, they dropped dummies with latex or plastic skin from high altitudes attached to parachutes. So basically saying that the dummies looked like the alien bodies that they had found at the crash site. At Roswell. Well, why wouldn't you just say that from the beginning then? And how dumb would you have to be to look at a body and be <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's an alien when it's a freaking dummy. dummy like, yeah. Come on. Yeah. That's really discrediting to all the people. Yeah. That, that claim it. to have yeah. seen these bodies. Like mm -hmm. you're calling them all liars and dummies pretty much. They're, yeah. You're calling them dummies. too. <laughs> so I, I don't know. It's just, it just seems to me like too convenient that of course they had two projects to secret projects that they were doing. One was dropping dummies, mannequins <laughs> from the sky with parachutes. 
what is that really testing? I know. Seems like such a distraction. Then, oh, we were doing weather balloons and that's what it was. So you saw the combination of these two projects come together on the same night in Roswell. Why wouldn't you say that from the beginning? Yeah. I know. It, it does. I mean, this it thing took us a while to get our story right. together. <laughs> if that's in, in fact what had happened, then this would have been mm. never even something we know about today. Right. Totally. It would have been, Oh yep, That happened. Yep. Case closed. Moving on. But yet that wasn't the case in the beginning. And you also might be wondering like, Hey, like how, how are they saying that these dummy drops were somehow involved with Roswell when they didn't happen until the mid 1950s? Right. Well, that gets explained by, you know, the people that support this theory that, Oh, people from that time period are just, you know, confusing memories and that, you know, this all, this all happened the way that it did that the way the military said, and people just are confusing things and, you know, don't remember. Right. But I, I just don't buy that at all. Cause I mean, there's so many eyewitnesses to this event that were involved. I mean, through investigations done by different uh, people of the UFO community, they've uncovered that uh, the Brazels were actually confiscated by the military at one point. Um, that, you know, Mar- Jesse Marcel, other people that were involved were bribed and told mm-hmm. that, you know, if you don't recant your story and, and what you saw and go along with our narrative, that you're going to be, yeah, in trouble. So I, I think that that seems like a very likely scenario to me that they would want to flip the story and flip the script and, Mm -hmm. you know, force people to, you know, exactly. So plus there were even locals that have been interviewed in the area of Roswell around where the crash was. And they've even said that, you know, whenever they've thought about coming out and speaking about what they had observed or what they actually knew that the military has actually threatened, uh, threatened them personally and to stop talking about the Roswell incident. People have even said that their homes have been searched by the authorities looking for stolen items from the crash site. And to verify that that's true, in fact, there's been you know multiple army officials that have come out that have said that, yeah, we were told to have an information blackout, uh, especially on in regards to the alien bodies. So again, multiple people in the military are coming out saying, yeah, this is, this is what really happened. They were trying to get us to cover this up. Uh, Colonel Butch Blanchard, again, who ordered the first press relief, went on sh- leave shortly after the story was debunked. Uh, of course, they had him leave leave the base mm-hmm. for a leave. <laughs> for a leave. Leave for a leave. <laughs> uh, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Briley, who actually worked on Butch's staff, said the leave was part of the cover-up operation to hide the UFO crash site from the public. Walter Hott, again, the public information officer, wrote in a sealed statement that the photo taken to prove the UFO was actually a weather balloon was a hoax. And it really does look like a setup photo. If you look at it, I mean, they're all Mm. kneeling down next to it. It's on this carpet. And really, why isn't that out in the field? Why aren't you doing the investigation out of the field? Yeah, that's really weird. Like, why would you just move the crash materials in there? It looks like the jankiest operation I've ever seen. It's like one of their offices or something. And they just have it laying on the ground. They're like, like, quick, get a quick pic of this. So it it looks like we did something. Yeah, he's all kneeling down, like looking at it and like, oh, look at what we found. I'm sure that's exactly the way that he had originally found it. Right. And yeah, the, he went on, uh, Walter Hot went on to say that the actual crash materials were substituted with weather balloon materials, and then they photographed with Marcel. And since Major Jesse Marcel's officer collected the materials from the site, he was upset about being forced to pose for the stage photo. And this sealed statement wasn't opened until after Walter Hot's death, which is interesting. Another individual who's come forward to talk about Roswell is Ben Games, and he was a personal pilot of Major General Lawrence Craigie the chief of engineering at Wright Patterson air force base. And as we talked about earlier, many people believe that the actual alien bodies along with the flying saucer were actually moved to Wright Patterson air force base where they were then uh, studied by the military. And Ben said he flew Lawrence Craigie to Roswell to inspect the crash site and wreckage. And they were in Roswell for a few hours. And later that same day, he then flew him to Washington DC to meet with president Truman A few months later, Lawrence was appointed director of research and development for the U.S. Air Force, and one of his first acts was to found Project Sign, the first official investigation of UFOs by the military. And although the military officially denies the existence of alien life forms, multiple military officials have heard rumors about alien bodies and a handful have claimed to have actually seen them. Also in the 1990s, a top-secret government document from September 19, 1947 was leaked. 
And the document was from Majestic 12's Project White Hot. And it said that 11 government agencies had examined the evidence from the Roswell site and deemed it was extraterrestrial in nature. The report also referenced a, quote, small neutronic power plant that was found inside the ULAT-1, which I believe is one of these craft. And there's even diagrams of it broken down. Uh, It had this portable neutronic reactor inside of it. This report also references the crash site in Missouri from 1941, explaining that no effort was made to exploit possible technological gains with the exception of the Manhattan Project during World War II. And the Manhattan Project results in the development and production of the first nuclear weapons. This means that Presidents Roosevelt and Truman were both aware that alien materials from the crash site in 1941 were being used to develop advanced weapons technology. And most of this information from this report from Majestic 12 is actually from General Nathan Twinning. And he was actually sent on a secret mission by President Truman to examine the Roswell 1947 crash site, wreckage, and recovered alien bodies. And on July 16, 1947, Nathan sent a two-page report to the president with a detailed description of the technology used to power the spacecraft, that portable neutronic reactor I was talking about. Nathan said there was no conventional electronics or wiring, but in the power room, he found something that looked like typewriter keys that he believed may have been in the reactor power plant controls. The keys had strange hieroglyphic type images on them. The technology was said to be eons ahead of our own. And yeah, I mean, that's what a lot of people said who have have looked at these materials, metals, and the hieroglyphs is that it appears that this craft was like powered telepathically even i mean there's a lot of people Damn. there wasn't like actual controls in it uh in the craft itself so how they pilot it yeah and oh. people's arguments are like okay well if it was aliens and they did have this technology to travel across the universe to earth how is it that they crashed like why would their <laughs> ship crash that's true well shit happens well not only does shit happen but again the bases in this area, they did have things on radar. So many people believe that they actually shot them down, oh. that they actually had what are called scalar weapons, which shoot basically electromagnetic pulses into the atmosphere that somehow messed with the craft's mm-hmm. navigation or whoever's piloting them and forced them to crash. Wow. Mm-hmm. And that actually when UFOs crash, it's not because they just are shitty drivers. It's because... <laughs> They're being shot down by the military. The military have weapons to bring down. That would make sense like though, that. right? If yeah. They're in our airspace. Right. They're able to, they're going to do it. Right. And then in 1995, people around the world were shocked when an entrepreneur and documentary filmmaker from London, Ray Santilli released footage that he claimed was an alien autopsy by military <laughs> doctors of the bodies recovered from the Roswell incident. I feel like, people use this footage to discredit Roswell or to discredit alien theories in general, because it's so ridiculous and embarrassing for the community. Really? (laughs) It's a 17 minute long clip that's taken apparently by a retired military cameraman who sold it to Ray while he was in the U S making a documentary about music. Uh, I mean, I don't know. We have a clip. Yeah, but I would play it, but it'll get us age restricted. Oh, oh, yeah. Even though this clip is comes that back to be a hoax, apparently. It is. According to the filmmaker, he said that he used pig no. brains and animal yeah. organs to mimic the body yeah, parts. Yeah, it's clearly a hoax. But YouTube thinks it's real because they age restrict it. I checked well, the video earlier. It's probably because, I mean, think about it. They're, they have reviewers that are trained to just, if something looks like that, they're going to be like, you know what? Let's keep ads off that shit. Because it does look like a naked human or maybe something scary is going on or... Um, I don't know. It looks it does it's look pretty freaky. It looks pretty, pretty real to graphic. me. Graphic, yeah. really not ad friendly. I mean, I get it. Yeah, yeah, very weird. But yeah, it came. The guy came out and said it was all a hoax. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, not real. So yeah, I just wanted to clarify that because some people do believe that that footage is real. <laughs> well, this is interesting. So in 2019, uh, a man named Robert Bigelow. Very, very interesting guy. Everybody talks about yes. Elon Musk. I want people to know about Robert Bigelow. I know he's interesting. People really miss out on him. Yeah, they really do. Cause he's not like out. He's not like Elon out mm. there on Twitter and in the public eye. Like, yeah, really soaking it up. Yeah. This yeah. guy's very behind the scenes. Uh, he's a billionaire. Genius. Really smart. He's got an aerospace company, Bill Bigelow Aerospace. That's got like an alien head as a logo. But he's, he's very interesting guy because he's been in UFOs a very long time. He had a personal encounter of one. Uh, when he was uh, younger 
And he actually bought Skinwalker Ranch. If you've watched that episode of ours, he owned Skinwalker Ranch for some time, and he's very interested in the paranormal and especially UFOs. The reason we're talking about Robert Bigelow is because he obtained a leaked memo regarding alien autopsy footage or, or whatever. And apparently this leaked memo said that a CIA scientist named Kit Green was briefed three different times during and after his tenure at CIA on topics relevant to UFOs and Roswell incident alien autopsy quote, and Kit had been shown reports and photos from the alien autopsy at a Pentagon briefing. And these photos match the alien body seen in the video footage from that alien autopsy video we were just talking about. And after providing a professional evaluation of the footage, Kit wrote a thorough report and the summary of and the summary of that report says the alien autopsy film video is real. The alien cadaver is real. And the cadaver seen in the film video is the same as the photos Kit saw at a 1987-88 Pentagon briefing. This leaked memo that he got also stated that tissue and organs from the autopsy have been stored at Walter Reed Armed Forces Institute for Pathology Medical Museum in Washington, D.C. Which means that if the video footage was a hoax, a hoax. <laughs> which this means if the video footage was a hoax, a hoax, then it managed to fool a top CIA scientist. Mm. So conflicting <laughs> really? reports there. So the film is saying it's fake, but that could be because somebody told him to say it was fake. Oh, and this guy who was a CIA scientist is saying that this body in the footage fake. looks a lot like the photos that he saw from Roswell mm. bodies. I mean, that's interesting. I still feel like it's fake, but. I don't know. This just looks so ridiculous. Maybe, maybe not. What are the outfits that they're wearing to work on them too? They look like executors or something. Oh, well they're like hazmat suits. I mean, they don't, would you want to touch an extraterrestrial <laughs> no, body? I guess not. Without still, knowing it what's just on looks it? Scary. <laughs> it does. And I mean, yeah, the, the body does look kind of fake, but at the same time, I mean, that's pretty, mm. pretty detailed. Hmm. I want to know everyone's opinions on that because I mean, most people be like, yeah, it's fake. <laughs> But if you know about this leaked memo that Robert Bigelow had then about the CIA scientists, then maybe that might sway your, your yeah, opinion or maybe just, I don't know. Think twice. Cause as we've seen throughout the entire Roswell story, people are being shut down, told to stop talking about this, to say this is fake, to cover it up. But then again, I don't know. We don't have any way to verify that this footage is real. We don't have any way to verify where it came from. Mm. And also, you really think that the military would have video footage of this and just have it leaked that easy? Yeah. Like, okay, no, this person would be dead. <laughs> the filmmaker yeah. would be dead if Definitely. he put this out. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Could be fake. Maybe it's real, but at the end of the day, Roswell will remain a mystery mm -hmm. because we just really don't know. And you know, whether it's fact or fiction, Roswell, the actual town has embraced Oh, this this yeah. history and lore. I mean, it's they it's have a festival a every year. Yeah. Oh, they have so many things related to it. They have whole hotels that are themed alien and gift shops. Yeah, and merchandise. And it's really helped their economy yeah. since this all started. It's a huge tourism. Mm -hmm. They're proud go. of it. I know. Let's we got to make a trip down there after COVID because oh, yeah. that would be really fun. I think it'd be a cool experience. We would have a lot of fun there. Yeah. And I mean, they've got museums mm -hmm. there. They've got all kinds of cool stuff. Oh, it's there. a whole tourist thing now. And people, tons of people go through there every year now. Yeah. When this was just a little farming town before. Yeah. There wasn't much going on there at all until bada bing, bada boom. They got yeah. <laughs> alien company. Put it on the map, baby. So at the end of the day, what do you think? Do you think this was one of the three theories? Was it some type of weather balloon or other something else? Or was it a government cover up as far as secret? Uh, I mean, I believe that at the end of the day, you really can't determine completely what it was. I think it's quite possible that it was something military related that they just wanted to hide for other reasons. But I am, I believe more so that it was possibly an actual alien craft, but I think like with most conspiracy theories and these stories that have been re reported on over and over again, they're so old at this point that there's, you know, there's a little bit of truth. There's a little bit of lies and it's kind of all mixed together and the truth somewhere kind of in the middle between the skeptic, the skeptics, point of view and the believers point of view. So I That's think a it's a little, it, yeah. little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really hard because there's not like a ton of physical proof, right? Mm -hmm. There's very little actually. Right. So you're going off of a lot of people's 
I saw this, I heard this, you know, I, you know, I witnessed statements of their personal experience regarding Roswell. Yeah. And I'm not saying that I don't, I don't believe it was real at all. I mean, I think something happened. I think the government did cover up whatever it was. I don't think it was a weather balloon. Well, yeah. And I mean, now that we know the government covered up other UFO programs they were running, Mm -hmm. uh, that the Pentagon was running. I mean, to me, it makes a lot of sense that they would cover up, up this whole thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I a hundred percent believe there was a cover up, and I strongly believe that this was something not of this world. I think there's just too many people who have reviewed debris from the site who have actually seen bodies who are way more credible than most of us out here, Mm. especially in regards to what the military is doing that. I don't think you can just discount all of that and be like, well, that's just their, you know, their opinion or that's just what their viewpoint is on it. I think you got to take that as evidence. I mean, we take, eyewitnesses statements and crimes seriously and we well, take to you know an extent right Witness statements are normally really off yeah the they're part. they're they're off but they're also that the police do go and ask yeah. people what they saw yeah. to help gather evidence and so. these people like you said have we have a reason to believe credentials yeah, yeah. i mean they they're have, saying and it's like are they all just making it up you why know? would they do that yeah i mean i definitely take the opinions of some of the top ufologists out there and most of them believe in this, if not all of them. Yeah. And especially when you connect the dots too, right? Like a lot of ufology is connecting the dots between events, mm-hmm. between similarities in events and what the craft looks like. I mean, we've heard the saucer thing before. Look at Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar worked at S4 area 51 and he worked on flying yep. saucers craft exactly yeah. like what we, what we found in Roswell. I agree. I believe Bob. So I yeah, Bob. I, I believe Bob too. Gotta believe Bob. Hashtag believe Bob. Yes. Believe Bob. Hashtag I believe Bob. Lazar, Bob. Man. I mean, so for me as a believer in extraterrestrials and UFOs, I believe that this was in fact aliens that, that were shot down in New Mexico that were then, you know, they said one of them survived actually two of them were, were dead, but one actually was living when they recovered it. Uh, according to people that, know anything about this so So you wonder what happened to him right where'd this guy go Mm. and there's tons of other theories and other secret projects out there that you know zeta reticuli and all of that so there's so many things where you know that alien we found in roswell actually been working with the military and government officials to establish (laughs) contact to their home world Maybe. And that's all been kept under wraps rule it out that's for sure what do you think janelle Mm, i think it's kind of what you said that's something along the lines of both i don't know i can't like definitively say like, mm-hmm. yes it was aliens i can definitely see how it would be the uh, military trying to cover some shit up mm-hmm. which they or do the government yeah they they do that all the time all the time so either way though like regardless of what it what it really is i think it's so cool that like we found this material that was like yeah. supposedly out of this world and even let's say it's not and it's just some material military material that they have that's still crazy that they have that and that's yeah exactly that either way it exists so what where it came from not sure but i definitely don't think it was a fucking weather balloon yeah that's what i'm sure i mean yeah and weather balloons are not made of that type of material exactly and if they did have something like that you'd think it would be used more often or we would have heard about it by now why would they try to keep a a type of metal secret Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah, there's there's so many reasons why they would cover this up. Yeah. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. We definitely want to know what you guys think of the whole Roswell incident. Um, also, be sure to check out our merch. Again, that is milehiremerch.com. This collection is limited edition and not being restocked. So if you want to get any of the mountain Mile Higher Mountain Retreat collection, definitely check that out. That was something that we wanted to do, actually. A, a real yeah, we've mountain. been talking about this. Yeah, doing like a actual in the mountains, like little j- retreat with mm-hmm. like a select group of you guys. Yeah, we and, were like, thinking just, about it last year. Yeah, we were. We we're like, that'd be really cool to go up into the mountains and just like talk conspiracy <laughs> and and true crime out. for three days or whatever, and just yeah. chill like with that'd a. Would be the coolest. Maybe we'll do that one day. That'd be really fun. Yeah, maybe you know, post pandemic, the yeah. sky's the limit. God, if we can just get past this freaking <laughs> pandemic, man. I know. Know. Our life would be so Exhausting. much better. Guess again, like ah, I know. So many things we definitely, that we've been yeah, to. it really has affected a lot of things. Um, but in yeah. such a small way compared to the way it's affecting the world, you know, like boohoo. Yes, yeah. we can't have yeah, guests and we can't yeah. have a meetup. But I know you guys <laughs> wish we could as well. 
Um, it, it would be nice if things were different for sure. But until then we have, you know, the mile higher, uh, retreat collection, mountain retreat collection. Hopefully it gives you the vibes of being on a mountain retreat and you can just pretend we all went on a retreat until one day we actually get to go. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that day. Yeah, me too. That would be really fun. <laughs> too much fun. Honestly, it would be. We'll go ahead and wrap up today's episode there. Thank you guys so much for joining us for another episode of the Mile Higher podcast, the Roswell UFO incident. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. But until next time, stay safe and stay woke.